the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I was uh, talking in the last lecture about uh, the problem of the so-called Oedipus complex. And uh, I was trying to show that the essential problem is not of the fixation to mother, is not uh, the sexual fixation, but is a deep emotional, affective bond to what mother represents or may represent emotionally. And that this bond is one of the deepest ties which exist for the child, but which exist also for the adult. And I was talking about the fact that either there can be the almost euphoric security or certainty of being loved by mother, or on the other hand, the dread, the panic of mother as being destructive, as being able to not to give life, but to take life. <clears throat> now, uh, what do we, Freud speaks about mental health in the sense that a person is healthy if he solves the problem of his Oedipus complex. And he means by that, that essentially, if you overcome the incestuous fixation to mother in the sexual sense and is capable of having sexual, but also in general, an emotionally warm, loving attitude toward a woman different from mother, and in a way that would hold true for the woman too. Now, it follows from what I have said in last time that I would um, define the overcoming of the Oedipus complex, if I use this word in a somewhat broader sense, namely that it means the attainment of independence, the attainment of full individuation, and that the failure in solving the Oedipus complex lies in the failure to attain independence, a failure in the process of full individuation. And I should like to say something about two forms in which this failure, failure appears or manifests itself. <coughs> One, is an extremely pathological one, and one is a less severely pathological one and a more frequent one. The very pathological and uh, <coughs> form of failure in attaining independence or individuation, uh, I should like to call symbiosis, or symbiosis, if you please. Namely, sim, together living. Living together with another person, feeling oneself part of the other person, and the other person part of oneself. Uh, in fact, the symbol for full symbiosis is the fetus in the mother's womb. The fetus in the mother are one, in spite of the fact that they are two. The mother is one with the unborn child, and the child is one with the mother. The child could not live without the mother, as long as it is, is in the intrauterine state. Now, physiologically and biologically, this is all very simple. And at one point, the child is born and breathes by itself with his lungs. But psychologically, it is by no means that simple. You find people who emotionally never transcend the stage of the fetus, who remain one with the mother. It can also be with the father. It is as if they could not breathe without the oxygen given them through the other person. Now, when such a person grows older, then the real problems begin. As long as he is a few months old or even a few years old, there is no serious problem. And in fact, then the symbiotic state is, stage is, or state is to some extent quite natural because it takes 
you might say the human being is characterized by the fact that he's born too early. Uh, in contrast to animals who are born at the right time when they are able pretty soon to cope with the environment. <coughs> the human being is expelled from his environment too early, but that gives him also the great chance of uh, finding his way of adapting himself to the world in those first months or even in the first years of relative helplessness. So at that stage of development, the symbiotic stage is still relatively normal. But what I'm referring to here are people who never go beyond this symbiotic stage, although intellectually and physiologically they grow up to be 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50. In their feeling, they are still one with the person, be it of the mother or of the father, which is more rare, as I said, and there is a peculiar lack of sense of seeing the difference, just as you find that <clears throat> in the newborn baby. The person feels that he and his mother are one. Sometimes he feels, or his father, he is superior. Sometimes the father is superior. But he cannot experience the reality that he and father or he and mother are two different separate persons. Uh, later on, and you see that in analysis very often, the role of the father and mother can be transferred to another person, to an analyst, or as a case may be, to a gynecologist, or as a case may be, to a priest, or to a political party. Uh, but what you see is always, this person cannot live. It is as if he couldn't breathe, unless he is one with whatever he has chosen as his co-liver, if you please, and forgive the bad, <coughs> the um, uh, somewhat clumsy word. He cannot live by himself. And actually, when you find this in extreme forms, you have very often cases of psychosis, where you find as a main as a central issue, this problem of an extreme and unresolved symbiotic need. <coughs> Very often, you might find that the difficulty or the imp incapacity to distinguish between you and me, between mother and me, leads to an incapacity of appreciating reality outside of myself. I am not, I don't know who I am, because the other person is me and I am her. Um, what we find in such persons is that if the symbiotic bond is threatened, they react with intense anxiety, in fact, with panic. You can see that in uh, analytic treatment, when the symbiotic bond has been transferred to the person of the analyst. But you can find it, of course, outside of analytic treatment. You may find people then who, with the death of a father and mother, uh, experience severe panic, not sadness, not a loss, but severe panic, even the possibility of uh, a psychotic breakdown. You might find persons who are married and who tell you that they are nothing but unhappy, and yet they are perfectly incapable of leaving the other person, and sometimes two persons work together in this way without intending to, because the one person or both persons are related to the other person as a living being without whom they simply cannot live. And they would rather endure everything than to be confronted or faced with the panic of separation. Uh, that sometimes, this uh, panic has sometimes been named a uh, separation anxiety. Uh, one of the most gifted analysts, Rank, uh, thought this is a repetition of the birth trauma. Now, I think that was perhaps a little 
naive to think that the birth trauma in itself is repeated later, uh, but I, uh, that was following Freud's own theory of considering everything a repetition of something earlier. But actually, we are born every moment. Uh, every moment is the question of separating ourselves to become ourselves. And uh, uh, you find a very excellent description of this phenomenon in a book by Madame Sechet, Symbolic Satisfaction, which is a description of a schizophrenic patient who could not endure the separation. And in fact, in psychotherapy, very often the problem is how slowly, slowly, slowly wean the patient first from the most extreme form of symbiosis and eventually giving him the <coughs> what <coughs> this author calls a symbiotic satisfaction of the, sim of the symbiosis, but slowly reducing it, reducing it, helping the patient to be able to live a little bit more by himself or herself. And under the protection of this symbiotic relationship, which continues in the therapy, eventually reaching the point where the patient is born and can, where the symbiotic bond can be cut. This is a terribly difficult thing because what you find sometimes is that it seems as if the bond is almost completely cut. The patient lives alone and there's nothing but that he sees the therapist once a week. But that you find if the therapist would not see him once a week, the patient might have a relapse of a psychosis or two psychotic, or might have a psychotic breakdown. Because this need for the symbiosis is so strong. And the panic remains when the last bit of a tie is cut or when the tie is completely cut. Now, I know this is to most of you probably rather, except for professional uh, psychiatrists or psychoanalysts, rather remote because I hope you have had very little occasion to uh, know people who are that sick because that is, ex is indeed this extreme form of symbiosis is great sickness, implies great sickness. But then there are also all kinds of symbiotic attachment. I mean, there are the completely mal malignant one, which I describe right now, which are psychotic or very close to psychosis. There are symbiotic forms in which somewhat more of the individuality of the person has been retained. The symbiosis, you might say, the symbiosis is not that total. You find that sometimes in dreams, for instance, where a person dreams that, let us say, his back or his shoulder is grown together with something, with a tree, with the earth, with a bed. And you can see part of this person finds himself in a symbiotic situation, but he is not insane because it's only part. The extremely grave situation you find when it's not just the shoulder or the head or a leg or a foot, but when the whole person cannot live by himself. I think you find it sometimes, at least that's what I've been told by people who are specialists in this field, in a Rorschach that the lungs, seeing lungs at a point where most people don't see lungs, may signify that this person feels he or she cannot breathe by himself and is an indication of an extreme symbiotic uh, attachment. Now, uh, you can order the degree of symbiotic attachment in terms of intensity and in terms of totality. And then you come to, uh, and this is, these are really nuances which are quantitative. Uh, nuances, however, they turn from the quantitative into the qualitative, you come to what you might call extreme dependency. The dependency is somewhat different from the symbiosis because a dependency, you might say in the dependency, there's I who is dependent on somebody. 
But in the symbiotic attachment, there is no I which is dependent on somebody. Because an, a self, an individual entity, has not even been established. Uh, you cannot really say that the fetus is dependent on the mother. Uh, you can say that a five-year-old boy may be dependent on the mother. But the five-year-old boy has already established his own being as something different or somebody different from the mother. Now, the degrees of dependency also vary. You might say that the symbiosis is still being tied to mother's womb. And then you find people are tied to mother's breasts, to mother's lap, to mother's hand. These all are different degrees of dependency. And you find then that a neurosis in which a person is dependent on mother or father. If we symbolize it by being dependent on father's hand, he needs a, somebody who guides him always, somebody who praises him, somebody who tells him what to do. Well, we might say perhaps the majority of people in our society are still at the stage of dependency on father's hand because they believe what the authorities do say, they do what the authorities say, they have very little critical judgment, and uh, this is usually called, uh, they have their own, uh, they are, <clears throat> well, whatever word we use, they are, let us say they are good citizens. Uh, that is one way of saying they are dependent on father's uh, hands, or whatever would replace, substitute for the hand. That is indeed not severe sickness. Uh, one can function very well, provided one lives in the right environment where one has a father who tells one what to do. And if one doesn't have enough striving for independence to get in conflict. Uh, what I meant to say was that this process of individuation, this process of development in which I become I, while physiologically and biologically it's a very clear process of a development from the fetus to birth to the full maturation of the neurolo neurological system, etc., etc., it's a physiological system. Emotionally, it is a very complicated process which ranges from the most severe sickness, namely complete symbiosis, to less ominous forms of symbiosis, to various forms of dependency, and I would say one could differentiate a mental illness in terms of the degree of symbiosis versus dependence and eventual independence which has been achieved. The problem uh, is then always to what extent has a person established himself as a person in his own rights? Has he become an individual? To what person, to what extent can a person say, I am I? Well, most of us can't. We do, but we have no right to do so because that what, uh, as I tried to say before, what we really experience is, I am we, I am father. And that's why Freud could say that conscience is really the inter internalized form of father's commands and prohibitions. Freud was descriptively, he called that the superego. Freud was descriptively perfectly right. Uh, that's what it is for most people, except there is a conscience which is not the internalization of father's prohibitions and commands. A conscience which is, as you might say, the voice of our total personality which calls us to ourselves. The voice of our own feelings of our own aliveness, of our own reason, which may be quite in contrast to Father's commands and prohibition. That is diff conscience in a different sense. Well, I see it's five of nine, so we have the usual procedure to stop for a moment. Uh, I don't see any... Well, here are some chairs. One, two, uh, is there one chair? Two chairs. Here are two chairs. Hmm? 
Hmm? How many? Five. Five. There are five chairs here. There's nothing more left there, no. All right. Uh, the level of individuation which the average person attains is obviously determined by the structure of the society in which he lives. If you take many primitive societies, you find very little individuation, the whole of the group is still like mother's, not like mother's womb perhaps, but there is very individuality, little individuality, uh, uh, little ambition. Most of the ugly things which we have are not there and most of the best things are not there either. It is an extremely unalienated but primitive and undeveloped life. Now, our modern society has uh, really cut through and dissolved all these primary bonds. Man is alone since the end of the Middle Ages. And for that reason, he is afraid. He is told that he ought to be independent. But actually, he is told that, uh, and it is meant really, was meant originally, he ought to be independent economically. And so came the 18th and 19th century, which talked a lot about independence and freedom, because while the worker was not independent, he had simply to do what he was hired for, and he had, he had, he had to be hired in order not to starve. Uh, <clears throat> but in the middle class and the upper class, there was a good deal of independence, because there, this was a time of an individual entrepreneur who had capital, who started it, who did what he wanted at his own risk. Now in the 20th century, that is a rarity. In, uh, that's why to talk even about capitalism today in the West is something uh, quite questionable because it's so different from the system of the 19th century. Uh, uh, if you have, um, if you are, uh, let us say, sell oil, if you have a gas station, you may be independent formally, but really you are only uh, part of the system uh, of the gas, of the company, of the oil company, uh, and you are in some ways worse off than if you were a straight employee, because you have some of the risks and not enough of the security, perhaps. Yet, it gives you the feeling sometimes, or other people at least think you're an independent man. If you're in the big corporation, well, uh, your individual initiative is uh, also, um, uh, not entirely what it was or what it used to be when you had the private entrepreneur of the 19th century. Actually, every society uh, sets the limits for the kind of independence which it needs for its own functioning. Uh, <clears throat> 19th century society uh, was uh, limiting the independence of the worker more than 20th century society. At the same time, 20th century society has precisely limited the independence of the middle class more than, or the upper middle class more than the 19th century did. <clears throat> you might say today a skilled worker is freer than he was in the 19th century, and uh, a junior executive is uh, less free than an independent entrepreneur would have been uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, you might say that the figure of the independent man in many ways is what you find in mythology in the figure of the hero. The person who owes his existence to himself and who does not serve anybody, not even the gods. That's why the great hero in Greek mythology is Prometheus, 
who steals the fire from the gods, and he doesn't really steal it, he takes it and gives it to man because man needs it. And he is too independent to be afraid of the punishment of gods. In Hebrew mythology, the equivalent of Prometheus are Adam and Eve, or we should better say Eve and Adam. Uh, they don't, they disobey. They do not accept the role of remaining ignorant, and they accept the punishment, which then in Christian theology has been interpreted as a punishment for original sin. Now, in the, if you read the Bible, there is no word of sin about that, and also in the Jewish tradition, this has not been considered a sin for which man has to suffer, uh, or for which man has to be punished. You might say the independent man in any society is what you could call the hero or the revolutionary, as against the rebel. The rebel is a man who fights authority with a secret wish that he could be the authority himself. The revolutionary, in a broad genetic sense, is a man who wants his full independence and who is not willing to accept that which he does not believe and does not feel. Uh, well, uh, that's why revolutionaries in this sense are very rare, because it's a very difficult achievement, and uh, yet it is very interesting to study the difference between the rebel and the revolutionary, because a rebel is not a man of independence. He's a man usually of anger, of hate, and as I said, a man with a wish to be the authority himself, and then he will be just as sadistic and authoritarian as those were against whom he rebelled. In the revolutionary, you have no sadism and no authoritarianism, but you have a passionate wish for independence. Now, I should like to talk about the topic which was announced, announced for this lecture, namely the nature of neurosis and the condition of cure. And I find this rather embarrassing. Because to talk about the nature of neurosis and the conditions of cure in an hour, or in fact what's left in 40 minutes, is rather ridiculous. Uh, and uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed even to have given this topic as one for one hour. So I uh, have to apologize, really, and to hope that uh, you will understand that all I can try to do is to touch certain problems which are uh, related to the problem of the nature of neurosis, the conditions of cure, uh, and hoping that it might be uh, suggest to you some thoughts, interest you, and lead you to thinking more about it and reading more about it. But what I have to say is certainly very inadequate in relationship to the difficulty and complexity of the topic. Now Freud's view of the nature of neurosis was essentially this that in the neurotic person, the ego is not strong enough to control the id. This can be because the id is constitutionally particularly strong, or the ego is constitutionally particularly weak. But at any rate, you have in the neurosis an ego which cannot control sufficiently the id, which, however, in contrast to psychosis, is not completely flooded by the id. Then you have a psychosis but the ego fights with the id, but it cannot control it. That is his concept of neurosis, and his concept of an elite cure was to make the ego stronger, so that it is able to control the id, that is to say, the instinctive drives better, and this is achieved by helping the consciousness to become aware of the unconscious. As Freud once said, where there was id, there should be ego. That is to say, the ego should be strengthened by the process of uncovering the unconscious. Now, it's interesting that in Freud's thinking, the term control plays a role here. And we can see in this concept of control remnants both of Christian thinking and of uh, modern scientific thinking. I say Christian thinking because there you start out with the original sin, with the evil in man, and the moral problem is how can man control the original evil in him? Now that is uh, <clears throat> Christian thought, and therefore the question of controlling the evil becomes very important. 
but it is also connected to the modern concept of control of, of nature by man. And actually, the id are the natural forces in man, and Freud in this respect is uh, influenced not only by Christian tradition, but by the concept of modern science, namely man with his reasons controls the natural forces within himself. And in this process, he overcomes neurosis. Well, uh, this is uh, perfectly, uh, this is Freud's, uh, the essence, I would say, of Freud's concept of neurosis and analytic cure, and I have no quarrel with it. I should just, uh, or in as much as I would have some remarks to make about it, uh, they are too specific for the time we have available here. I should like to mention, however, that you can express or define analytic uh, neurosis also in certain other ways. You could define it, and I'm referring to what I just said a few minutes ago, you could define it as a failure in the process of individuation. As a failure in the process of individuation. Uh, the person is neurotic to the degree to which he fails in this process of individuation, and you might add beyond that limitation which is given by his society. Uh, in a primitive tribe, or in the Middle Ages, or in modern society, we find that the process of individuation is also not carried through to its full end, that is to say, to full emancipation. But the whole, if a person reaches that level which is common to the whole society, he is well adapted and he is not neurotic because he feels safe and secure and confirmed by the consensus this is how a man ought to feel. But if a person fails in achieving individuation more than it is customary in his society, then we might say that is one aspect of defining neurosis. Another aspect of defining neurosis is the failure in developing a productive attitude. That is to say, relying on one's own active efforts and instead of that feeling that everything has either to be received with an open mouth or to be taken with a biting mouth or to be hoarded uh, because there is a feeling nothing can be produced. You might say in general, the person, the neurotic person, has failed in developing a sense of productiveness. By that I don't mean being an artist or anything like that, but of relying on his own hands, on his own mind, on his own powers, as something which can produce things. And eventually, you might define neurosis still in another sense, the person who has not achieved a sense of identity, who cannot say I, who has to borrow his identity from the group and therefore becomes terribly dependent on the group or on another person. How many people are, have a sense of identity only by feeling that they are what they want, how, that they are what others see in them. That is to say, they project a picture of, certain, of a certain personality, often called persona, and then they feel, I am I in as much as they represent what they are trying to project. Uh, many people <clears throat> find this sense of identity in relationship to another person. There you have already the problem of symbiotic relationships, that a person feels I because another person is accustomed to look at him and to take him as he. Uh, and of course, then you have, and I mentioned that already, the widespread phenomenon of finding a pseudo-identity by belonging to a group. That's why it's so terribly important for people, for most people, to belong to a group, because they feel, I am we. As an isolated person, as me right here, all alone in the world, and that is indeed one aspect of human existence, I, f I don't know who I am. But if I am part of a group, 
then I feel I am. I because I am an American, a Catholic, a Jew, a member of a lodge, a doctor, any number of things which give me a sense of identity because I experience myself not as an individual but as a member of that group. And you find even in religious phenomena the very same thing, that for many people uh, God is so important because by feeling, experiencing themselves as part of the religious group and as one of the worshippers, they feel they have a sense of identity. That should not be so, uh, from, even from a religious standpoint, but empirically this is often the case. Now you can see that all these three aspects are interrelated. If I am not capable of being productive, then indeed it is very difficult to reach uh, a high degree of individuation. And then, of course, it's also very, that's just the other side of the medal. I am lacking in a firm sense of identity. I have to lean on somebody, on something, on a group, on an institution to be able to remain sane because it's a very essence of sanity that I can feel I am I. <clears throat> and if I am lacking in that feeling authentically, then I have to create it artificially. I have to walk on crutches in order to be able to walk at all. Now you find sometimes uh, in dreams of people this uh, sense that they cannot walk by themselves in such symbols as they walk on a very glassy floor or on ice or they have a broken leg uh, or they are dizzy. In other words, the leg is very often the symbol of my own capacity to walk, to be independent. And in many dreams, the broken leg or the slippery floor are symbols of my incapacity to stand on my own legs or to walk with my own legs. <clears throat> Although consciously these people may not be aware of this at all. Now a word about various types of neurosis and psychosis. Well, you all know, uh, I guess, uh, that among the neurosis you differentiate between various disease entities, hysteria, compulsive obsessive neurosis, phobias, and those silent neuroses, which are often called character neuroses, and where a person has no particular symptom, but he feels, I'm not happy. Life doesn't make sense. I, as many people express it, I could do much more with my life than I do. I uh, don't use my energy. Uh, and yet, if you study these silent neuroses without symptoms, you still find that characterologically, one person might be closer to the uh, hysterical type, one closer to the compulsive obsessive type, to phobias, etc. Then you find the narcissistic neurosis, essentially the schizof various types of schizophrenia, of manic depressive neurosis, of paranoia, where actually the ego has given up. It has been drowned by the id, to speak in Freudian terms, and therefore there is no more fight, there is no more repression, on the contrary. That which in a neurotic person you try to bring to consciousness is consciousness in the psychotic person because there is so little contact with reality that there is no factor which uh, defends the consciousness of the person against the in invasion from the id or from archaic sources of the personality. Um, now, I think these disease entities have the advantages. Uh, to, it has a certain advantages to make these distinctions. Uh, I think that Dr. Menninger in one of his latest books uh, it goes a little too far to say that all these uh, uh, differentiations have, have, should be done away with. But at the same time, I would say uh, very often all this, uh, all this emphasis on disease entities uh, serves the purpose of labeling rather than of therapy. And of course, at a time, and that's not so terribly long ago, when psychiatry couldn't do anything more than labeling, 
it is quite understandable that it spent a great deal of energy and emphasis on defining the labels. So I think one shouldn't forget them, but also one should be aware that they do not justice to the individual case and that they have necess not necessarily uh, so much importance for judging the, the prognosis, the possibilities of cure, as 20 years ago most psychiatrists would, would have been prone to think. I would suggest that one could make another distinction, which is a very broad distinction, namely to distinguish between malignant and benign neurosis. And by malignant neurosis, I, in my malignant neurosis, I would also include psychosis. Now, I would say the malignant neurosis is characterized by three factors. Intense narcissism, uh, very profound symbiosis, and intense necrophilia. That is to say, intense fascination by all that which is not alive. I am referring to these concepts again here, and I have to say again, I have developed them <coughs> more in detail in this book, The Heart of Man. Now, it's very interesting to see that the really malign malignant forms of neurosis are to be found when all of these three factors are, to be to uh, are together. I uh, have seen instances where you find intense narcissism, intense symbiosis, but where you don't find necrophilia but biophilia. Now that changes the whole picture. On the other hand, you find cases in which you find intense narcissism and intense, and you find a good deal of necrophilia, but uh, uh, not so much uh, symbiosis. Uh, I uh, mentioned last time, I think, this uh, book on, uh, uh, on Picasso, there you see a man with a great deal of necrophilia, a great deal of narcissism, and practically unbearable narcissism, but uh, he is such an egotist that you cannot really say he is that symbiotically attached to anybody. He eats everybody up, he uses everybody, he has no concern for anybody, but that is not symbiosis. He is, this is his healthy side, you might say, an un an unlimited egotism. Well, that may not be very nice uh, from a moral or from any other standpoint, but the, you could not say this man is severely sick in the sense in which a person would be who aside from necrophilia and narcissism would also have a strong and deep symbiotic attachment. In other words, I think it is very important for diagnostic purposes to see what the relative strength of each of these factors is, and also whether they are all three together, or only two of them, or one of them. Then the whole picture <coughs> changes very, very uh, drastically. <coughs> you find, for instance, a rather narcissistic person with a great love of life. Well, they are not in danger of being severely sick. They may show all sorts of neurotic symptoms, but you don't need to worry. Uh, while if the very narcissistic person with a strong necrophilic trend, with a strong attachment to all that is decaying and dead, with dreams of, of worms and rats and uh, feces and uh, dismembered corpses, and so on and so on. Well, if they are also very narcissistic, that is to say, com completely unrelated to anyone else, then you have a reason to worry. Now, what I mean by benign neurosis is those forms of mental difficulties which were the nucleus of the personality is healthy. That is to say, where the core of the personality is neither extremely symbiotic, extremely narcissistic, or necrophilous, but where you have a marginal a disturbance, let us say, repressed anxiety, repressed hostility, repressed suspiciousness, or repressed sense of powerlessness. <coughs> and here, you don't have to worry at all, provided you succeed that this person, either by himself or by a good friend, or by the influence of a person who loves, whom he or she loves, is able to overcome these, these marginal disturbances. Uh, 
In this case, quite differently from in the case of the malignant neurosis, you have a healthy nucleus and only a marginal disturbance. Now, when I talk here about having people having a neurosis, I feel rather badly because I feel I'm really talking in a language which is customary, but really which is, which doesn't make sense. Nobody has a neurosis. Nobody has a problem. Nobody has a symptom. There isn't any such thing. A neurosis is nothing but a difficulty in living, and that's the expression which Heistak Sullivan used to, used to employ. But I would like to say we don't even have a difficulty in living. We live with difficulties. <laughs> and that would be the proper expression. And we live either with smaller or greater difficulties. Uh, we have to consider that, after all, we are not born as patients to be labeled by the psychiatrist. We are born as something very special, as human beings, that is to say, as animals, endowed with, aware, with the potentiality of becoming aware of themselves. The only case in, the, in nature in which this exists. We are born, we are thrown into the world at a place not of our choosing. We are taken away from the world at a time not of our choosing. We are thrown into a particular social situation, in, we are born in a particular social class. We are born in a particular family. There are many accidental factors which happen to us. And what we observe really is this piece of life thrown into the world, struggling usually against very adverse circumstances to make some sense of life. Let me take a very simple example. Uh, and of course, if I had the time, I could use many. A child, a little girl is born, the mother dies early, the father uh, marries another woman, he's a frightened man, the other woman is sadistic, the girl never feels at home. The never f but I don't mean at home in her house, at home in the world. She feels, she has a feeling as if she were a weightless leaf, a weightless piece of dust, somehow completely isolated in the world because she never has a feeling that there's any place to which, which is hers, that the world is hers. As a result of this weightlessness, of this sense of weightlessness, let us assume she wants to be fat. At least then she has weight. Then she will be not swept away by every wind, by every little circumstance or change of circumstances. She may attach herself. She may become homosexual. She may become attach herself to a man who protects her. But really she lives on a level of a three-year-old because she, for her, there is not yet the problem of love, the problem of sex, although she may sleep with girls or she may sleep with men. That all has no relevance there. She is a being which has never even attained the sense of identity, the sense of being in the world, of making a home in the world, which uh, usually a person at the age of three, four, five, six attains. Now, if we talk about her symptoms, that she suffers from a homosexuality or overeating, or we might say she is very hostile, then we talk about isolated, marginal things, and we do not see her in the suchness of her existence. All these symptoms are consequences of a certain way of being in the world. Uh, of a certain way of having, of trying to solve the problem of human existence, but failing. Uh, each person is the hero of a drama, and very often the hero of a tragedy. He is born, as I said, accidentally, 
and he makes efforts to make some sense and he often fails, most of the time he fails. And I think uh, <clears throat> the neurotic person, maybe more than any other person, deserves our admiration for the way he doesn't give up. He goes on struggling, trying to find solutions. But that's not only the neurotic person, every person is admirable as a hero of the drama. It is a great deal, I believe, the fault of modern psychology and psychiatry and psychoanalysis that we have lost the sense for that entity which one could call the suchness of the existence of a person. That sense in which that picture, that image of a person in which symptoms are only marginal phenomena and in which what interests us is what, sense, what way has that person chosen to make some sense of his or her life under the circumstances in which he or she finds himself and which, about which he or she can do very little. I think uh, only if we see it each person, whether that is a patient or a friend or anyone in whom we are interested in, not as a carrier of symptoms, like the carrier of bacilli or something, but as a particular form and a rather unique form in which a human being who is born into this world has tried to make sense of his process of living. Unless we do that, we really do not understand. We talk about the person, but we do not see the person because we, the person is not a summary of symptoms of complexes, of problems. The person is he, and even there we cannot say the person, this is his unconscious or his conscious, all this is he or she. And we have to understand exactly a person as we understand the hero of a Shakespearean drama, of a Greek drama. As one attempt, as one possibility, good or bad, or better or worse, is perhaps more correct to say, to make sense in the process of living. Now you might ask here whether I'm not really, uh, what I'm saying is not really existentialist psychoanalysis. Well, if you like the word, that's fine. However, I should like to emphasize that uh, the word existentialism is not only fashionable and therefore a little dangerous as a nationally advertised brand, but it is also uh, often misunderstood. Existential, the word existentialism has been used for the first time by Sartre in 1944. Uh, Heidegger very explicitly has said he's not an existentialist. Uh, um, certain things which are said to be essential for existentialism are really, like for instance, existence precedes essence, are uh, uh, not as, uh, are no definitions of existentialism. Uh, the one who has written about existentialist psychoanalysis is Sartre himself, and uh, whatever one may think otherwise about his philosophy, this is certainly uh, very superficial and without any penetration or knowledge of the facts of uh, human life. Now, if one shares Sartre's philosophy, I think there's a good reason then to talk about existentialism. Uh, I personally do not share it. I find that Sartre is the Max Stirner of the 20th century. Uh, I don't know to many of you, Max Stirner will not be a known name. I don't even know whether his book is translated. He wrote about 100 years ago a splendid book, Der Einzig und sein Eigentum, the, the unique one in his property, which was a brilliant exposition of the feeling of egotism of the middle class of the 19th century. It was really healthy it, because uh, at that time the middle class consisted of individuals who had a healthy egotism and could do something with it. I think uh, that Sartre's existentialism is uh, based on a rather morbid experience of life, namely of the extremely narcissistic individual who thinks that his own narcissism is uh, the model of human nature and therefore makes all sorts of theories which uh, are all uh, theories which might fit if the normal man were, were as narcissistic as uh, Sartre 
considers him to be. Now then Sartre has the ambition to be the philosopher of the future and therefore considers himself to be a Marxist too, which I think is doubted by many Marxists, and I think rightly so. Now, if one is in agreement with this, uh, this philosophy, then I think one has a good reason to talk about existentialism. If one is not, then I would prefer the terms humanism or realism. Because then what we do in talking about human existence is simply to talk about the man as he is physiologically, biologically, socially, and not about his ideas, and not about his problems, but about the real person as he exists. In this sense, exist, uh, the consideration of human existence, the existence of man is by no means the invention of uh, Mr. Sartre, but this is an idea which you find certainly in the last few hundred years in many, uh, by many other authors, one of the most uh, uh, distinguished one would be Marx, who, had, who has emphasized perhaps more than anyone else that we deal with the human being as he is in reality and not as he can be uh, deduced from his ideas or from his ideologies. Uh, you might think of Feuerbach, you might think of Russian philosophers, uh, you might think of uh, even of Catholic philosophy of the Middle Ages, uh, in which you find a good deal of attention paid to the reality of human existence. Uh, but indeed, whatever label one prefers, the fact remains, as I see it, that if we want to understand neurosis and and uh, psychosis, we must not try to understand a sickness, but we must try to understand a state of functioning and being. And that we can do only if we understand the whole man on the basis of his way of solving the problem of human existence, which is a problem which we all have to solve. Well, uh, let me say a few words about something which was announced as a topic for this lecture, and that is the role of childhood experience. Uh, I think Freud has shown, and that was one of his great uh, discoveries, that uh, experiences of early childhood are really of great importance for the later development. There are many psychological studies and many studies also in hypnosis which show how true that was. But at the same time, we must not forget, and I implied that already in what I said, man is primarily conditioned by his constitution, secondarily by the social class and by the social structure in which he is born, and only thirdly by the family into which he is born. And therefore, to assume, as many people do today, that there is an equation that what you are is simply the result of how your parents were, uh, that is very naive indeed. Uh, it also, this whole naive view is furthered by another assumption, and that is by a certain type of analysis, which thinks, uh, which assumes psychoanalysis is essentially to see what thing of the present is a repeat, or rather, what in the past is repeated now. In other words, the analysis consists to a large extent of indoctrinating the patient to find out what he is repeating. So he does this now, so he must have done it as a child. Uh, and then you find even a more primitive way of psychoanalysis, which labels everybody father, mother, oldest brothers, younger brother, sister, grand grandmother. So the analysis consists for years in saying, this is because you th this is your father, uh, trans transference to your father, or this is your mother. And everything is labeled as a figure of childhood. Now that is more like uh, Alice in Wonderland than a, a realistic appreciation of what goes on in a person. Uh, usually, uh, some things really remain untouched, but most people change. There is really very little direct repetition. A person starts with something in childhood, let us say, with great timidity. Now, this timidity may lead to uh, withdrawal. 
it may lead to many frustrations, and as a result, he develops a great deal of sadism. Now, the sadism is not the repetition of an early sadism. It is a consequence of something which started out as great timidity and lack of assertiveness, which may be a constitutional factor. Now, if you try to solve the problem of sadism by finding out where the sadism, where the original of the sadism is, in other words, if you try to look at everything as a copy of an original which is stored up in your childhood, you really uh, block the way to an understanding of what is the reality of this person, even an understanding of the historical development. Uh, and certainly nobody gets well by historical constructions. Uh, the, there are people who find, uh, who can recite, uh, if they are intelligent and brilliant, uh, can do it in a very complicated way, the whole history, development of their various drives and starting from early childhood, they have a whole theory about themselves. Well, that may be very interesting, uh, but nevertheless, it is quite useless as far as change is concerned. Uh, what, and I think that uh, is uh, certainly not the idea Freud had, it's a, it's a deterioration of Freud's idea. What matters is to be aware or to become conscious of that which I'm not aware of. And sometimes that means also to become conscious of certain experiences which I had, a, had as a child and which still are in me. But that is something quite different from historical reconstruction. Uh, you find also events or experiences in a child which are sometimes looked upon as a cause of later developments when they're actually only the first manifestation of something which isn't the character of the child. Let me give you one example from Freud's own life history. When Freud was a, was a little boy, he one time urinated into his father's bed, bed and said, when I'm big, I'll buy you a much bigger and better bed. Well, here you see a little boy who was already filled with a sense of his accomplishment, with confidence in himself, who looked down upon his father. It may very well be that he was already influenced by his mother's attitude to him, but you see here a little boy already with a great self-confidence. You might find that when he was even still smaller than when this accident occurred. Uh, such factors as self-confidence which somebody has are very often factors which are partly constitutional. They are, may partly be enhanced by the attitude of a mother or a father. But uh, very often they are just, you see the first manifestations in early age, in little things, not as causes for, of something which happens later, but as a first manifestation of something which is part of the existence of this person. And I think that while Freud has put great emphasis on the constitutional factors. In the beginning of his work, and if you remember in his uh, latest paper on analysis, determinable or indeterminable, he has always put great emphasis on co constitutional factors. Uh, in the analytic pra psychoanalytic practice, this emphasis is greatly not there. And there is usually only emphasis on that which one can analyze namely of certain traits as a result of certain experiences in one's family. Uh, I think in that way one over, overestimates often the uh, experience in the, the childhood experience and one, over, one, one over overestimates also the role of the family as against the role of the social class and the whole society in which a person lives. Um, most of what we are, we are really, most of what we are, we are really by uh, the social situation which we are born in. And that which is individually produced by the particular family is much less, has much less weight usually than the, fa the common social factors and the fact of constitution. So one should certainly take the uh, role of childhood experience and family very seriously but one should also be 
aware that there is danger of forgetting all other factors and thinking that everything is nothing but the result how father and mother were. And one should also remember something which Freud clearly saw, and that is that if one speaks of infantile traumas, of traumatic experiences, they have to be really traumatic. That means they must be more in quantity than what is the average experience. You hear sometimes stories in which a person says, well, I'm this way and that way because, let us say, as a little girl, a girl saw an exhibitionist who uh, uh, tried to show her the, his penis or tried to make her touch the penis. Well, uh, I don't think that that is a trauma which explains anything in the biography of a person, of a woman, because it happens so often. It's not one of those deeply traumatic things, just as little as uh, a story that father slapped the boy or mother slapped him because he took a cookie at the age of four and then he felt very resentful. All of these are not traumatized. And Freud talks about that. In fact, Freud makes the point that the chances for cure are better the more the trauma is a real trauma because the less great is a constitutional factor. Uh, if you find a patient who hasn't suffered any great trauma, but who is nevertheless considerably sick, then you must assume that there is a very strong constitutional factor and therefore the chances for cure are less good than if the traumatic factor were stronger and therefore the constitutional factor were less strong. Uh, uh, it is a little bit in contrast to what many people think that if the traumatic factor is strong, then the chances of cure are less. It's the opposite. It's the other way around. Um, now, I would say that the chances for cure depend on many factors and not necessarily on the nosological viewpoint or on the, on the particular kind of sickness a person is supposed to have. I think it depends a great deal on one factor, which is the way in which a person suffers from whatever is wrong in his life. And that doesn't need to be physical suffering. It can be emotional suffering. Suffering is one of the motives which make a person want to change. Uh, and that's why encouragement is one of the worst things the therapist can offer the patient. An attitude to say, well, things are not so bad and so on, serve to reduce the suffering, serve exactly to paralyze the mobilization of forces which would lead to a great effort to change. And nobody changes without a great effort. Therefore, there is nothing less conducive to cure then false encouragement. Uh, by that, a person can be vitally damaged in his, in his uh, attempt to mobilize his vital forces to change in order to change the situation. Other factors, of course, are the question of the person's vitality, whether the person take for whether for the person living is important or not. Uh, many people come for therapy with a wish to get rid of a symptom, but not to change. Well, sometimes you can get rid of a symptom without a fundamental change, but that is not a very durable thing, and there's a good chance another symptom will come, although I wouldn't underestimate the fact that a symptom which has been bothersome does disappear. Uh, but actually, uh, analytic cure in a broad sense requires a great interest in living, a vision of what life should be, a feeling that living is important and more important than anything else. And I think if one doesn't have that feeling, at best one might get rid of a symptom, or at best one might learn how to get along better in life by being told or taught certain things which one had overlooked. And here you can make a different, you can distinguish between an aim of, of analysis as uh, reform, education, as learning how to get along a little better, or as what you might call not reform but transformation. Now, by that I mean a really 
uh, uh, an energy charge in the nuclear structure of the personality. That may sound a little uh, difficult perhaps, but it's very simple. I have talked about before of what is a nuclear structure, the center of the person. Now let us assume a person, his nuclear structure is exceedingly narcissistic. And this narcissism is uh, an energy charge. I do not talk about libido here, but certainly the narcissism is held together and directed by an in a great deal of energy. Now, if you can change, if a person can change this narcissistic energy, even a little bit, even five degrees, then what happens is that in his nucleus, some basic change takes place, which would have tremendous effects on his whole life. If, however, you leave that nucleus untouched, the person keeps his narcissism, but he only learns how to hide it better, or how to use it better. The person remains the same, although he may have learned something uh, in a practical sense, how to get along better with his own sick or immature core of personality. But this is something quite different from, therefore, uh, transformation of a person, uh, energy changes in the nucleus are something quite different from uh, re-education or reform. Now, definitions of psychoanalysis vary a great deal. There are quite a few people who talk about psychoanalysis as if we're essentially re-education and reform and, uh, and who even forget that if a person gets older, usually he learns anyway. Uh, and if a person who thinks that if a person has um, made some progress in three, four years of analysis, do not think of the fact that he would have probably made some progress anyway in three, four years, unless he's so sick that he gets worse. But most people are not that sick. Most people actually get a little better as they learn uh, to use uh, the little tricks of life. But I wouldn't say that is really the proper subject, uh, the proper aim of analysis. Analysis is much too difficult, time-consuming, energy-consuming method, that it should be used for purposes which sometimes are very better fulfilled by an answer of a good psychologist in a column of a newspaper. If you read these columns, uh, sometimes that columnist gives an answer uh, to a practical problem, which is very satisfactory if it's intelligent, uh, while sometimes in psychotherapy, uh, two years are used in order to arrive at the same answer. Uh, I think you can uh, tell that a patient in two or three hours. Uh, and the patient will learn more of that than trying to mix analysis with a little practical sense and common sense and, and, and uh, education. Analysis is a very, and I have to stop here, is a very serious business. It is uh, the first attempt for a real science of man. Uh, analysis is sometimes called unscientific because it does not use and cannot use the methods which lend themselves to other aspects of psychology. But if you deal with a living person, you cannot kill the person or you cannot make him static. Uh, uh, and then it is much more difficult to understand something in movement, something living. And yet analysis is a laboratory. The analytic situation is a laboratory. If the analyst is really interested, then this is the most detailed study of human beings and human behavior which exists in the world. Uh, and any analysis, every analysis, is really a completely new research. It is a new attempt to find out what are the forces in one particular person which operate in him, and how he has come to use these forces, how he could possibly change them, you study in every analysis the existence of one person, the drama of one person, and you consider the possibilities of changing, not the first act that has been written already, but maybe the fifth act, by making the person aware of the first and the second and the fourth act. Uh, now, that is indeed a very serious business which requires to be taken seriously by the analyst and by the patient. If there is a gentleman's agreement that life should be comfortable in analysis, and so the patient will not uh, will always bring interesting and psychologically relevant material, 
And the analyst will also get not too bothered and excited because he has always something relevant to talk about. Then these two people kid each other. Each one has good intentions, but nevertheless, nothing happens because uh, the real things are not touched. And I would like to say, eventually, something which has it follows to what I've said before. That is, a sense for reality, uh, and I'm referring to what I said in the first lecture, the wish to find out what is really real in a person cannot be divided in two sectors. One, I want to know what's really real in my life, but I'm not interested in knowing what's really real in the world outside. One is, one is not blind with regard to some sub objects and seeing with regard to others. Either one sees, then one sees everything, or one is interested in seeing everything, or one is blind, then one sees nothing. But there are not people who, are, who see uh, a certain class of objects and are blind to another class of objects. If, as I tried to say in the beginning, the purpose of analysis is to see, to wake up, to find out what's really real, then it follows that this process is one in which this tendency must exist with regard to oneself, with regard to one's family, with regard to one's society, with regard to the world at large. That is to say, analysis, in my opinion, will be effective only in as much as it increases the sense of reality and the critical thought of a person with regard to all objects around him, including himself. Thank you. Are there any cases known whereby individuals were cured from neurosis by their own insight that is without help from analysts? Well, uh, there is no literature on that. Uh, but I have no doubts that people uh, in the past and even today with their own insight, had experiences which were as profound as an experience could be with the help of an analyst. Uh, it depends on many circumstances. Sometimes a person goes through experiences in life which have an enlightening effect, which reveal something, which make a change. Uh, sometimes one has talked about that in terms of conversion, uh, of religious conversion, uh, or of any other form of a new insight. Certainly uh, there are systems like Zen Buddhism which try to uh, help a person to come very close to reality, so close that he stops thinking about it. Um, well, there are no analysts involved, but great effort and thought uh, nevertheless, I think uh, for many people, uh, the analyst can be a help. But I think also it has become a fashion. One goes to an analyst much too easily and thinks actually use the analyst in order to avoid the fact that one has to make decisions alone. You know yourself, many of you do, how many people go to an analyst when they cannot make up your mind, their mind either to marry a girl or to get a divorce from the girl they marry. Well, analysis has a nice cushioning function. And uh, if you are afraid to make the decision now, you hope after five years you might make it. And yet you might find yourself at the same spot where you are now, because a decision can only be made in aloneness. Uh, but certainly, I think it would be a mistake to believe that a psychoanalysis is the only form in which a person can get insight. Uh, I um, spoke the other day to a good friend of mine 
who was uh, studying at a very fundamentalist uh, theological seminary in, in the South. And suddenly he experienced something. And that changed his whole outlook. And he came to uh, Union Theological Seminary here, which was at the time known as the most radical seminary, and uh, embarrassed him a little bit by his radicalism. Uh, now, he had not the benefit of analysis, but he saw something. He saw something of what of, of the behavior towards the Negroes in the South, and that was friend I'm talking about experienced that 30 years ago, which opened his eyes, and he became a different man. He became one of the most reliable, most realistic men I know. Uh, well, what permitted him to see at a certain moment something that was going on, which others couldn't see, is another question. But I give that just as one example in answering this question. Here's a question, would you consider it uncharitable for one to ask a matriarchal mother-in-law mother -in -law, to allow her son and daughter-in-law to make their own plans and decisions? Well, I can only say I would not consider it uncharitable if somebody wanted to murder me and I would say, I'm sorry, I don't want to be murdered. <laughs> uh, there are limits to charity and I think the limit is the life of a person and the right to live, and the right to develop, and the right to be alive. And uh, therefore, and that is very often simply uh, uh, people who sense, uh, who lack a sense of a right to live, then very often feel it's uncharitable to uh, prevent another person to take a pleasure in damaging oneself. Um, What is the relative uh, usefulness of analysis in the treatment of character disorders in, uh, as compared with treatment of neurosis? Well, I guess uh, the question would mean character disorders are usually called by analysts character neurosis. That is to say a neurosis which doesn't have manifest symptoms. And uh, it's a complica complicated question but I would say, where you have a symptom, you are always better off. And by you, I mean the analyst rather than the patient. But indirectly, the patient is better off too because a symptom is something clear cut. You know when it started. You can find out why it started. Therefore, you have a, like a beam which permits you to approach the problem of what is a character disorder more easily than when you don't have symptoms. Also, the symptoms usually show. The symptoms usually show there is struggle. Where there is symptom, there is li where there is a symptom, there is life, and where there is life, there is hope. You find many people who don't develop any symptoms, and who are just uh, slightly unhappy. Well, that is a vagueness, which is often makes it more difficult to approach uh, whatever this person suffers from. But uh, we have no data really, and that's one of the many things we ought to have data about the relative uh, success in cases with symptoms and in cases with um, uh, 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 character neurosis. We have insufficient data, we have some, but my own view is that on the whole, symptoms are cured more easily than a character, but very often what happens is that the symptom disappears and the character remains the same. And uh, then God knows whether the patient is really better off. Uh, because with a symptom he has something to show for, to himself. While if there is no symptom, there is a, a, even a greater embarrassment about what is lacking. What do you mean by constitution? Well, that is a terribly difficult question. Uh, in the first place, temperament. That is a recognized concept since the Greeks until the most recent psychological and psychiatric in investigations. You know, the Greeks have the four temperaments. Then we have recent studies on temperament, uh, which also have four or five temperaments, which are essentially not too different from the old Greek temperaments. Uh, let us say, 
you have a person who is choleric. Uh, you, uh, that is to say, he's easily excitable. He is what you might call with another symbol, fiery. And you have a person who is earthy. You have a person who is water-like. Uh, well, these are all I'm talking now in terms of the old Greek temperaments. But I think, actually, uh, there is much more uh, given constitutionally than just the temperaments. Uh, I think you'll find constitutional factors in sadism, in destructiveness, in a sense of independence, in, even in, in, a, in a quality of courage. Uh, but it is very difficult to establish this because not enough studies have been made about it. I think it will take many years of very exacting studies in children to really see which factors are constitutional and which are not. And also it must be said that in general the constitutional factor may incline but it doesn't determine. That is to say a person may be constitutionally timid. That doesn't mean he will become a coward. His timidity may turn into cowardice under certain circumstances. And it may, on the other hand, not turn into cowardice at all under other circumstances. The constitutional factor, if it is not extreme, is an inclination. But one can understand the role of environmental factors only if one considers that they are also constitutional factors which make an environmental factor have this or that influence. If you take, for instance, a timid baby, and you can see it in babies, an aggressive baby as a timid baby. Well, if that timid baby is exposed to much hostility, to beaten down from the very beginning, to sadism, then probably this timid baby will become a cowardly person. While if that timid baby is exposed to understanding, to friendliness, to love, to uh, a lack of intimidation, this timid baby may become a very introspective, sensitive person because he is not a go-getter, he will not rush into action, he will be observing, uh, he will be perhaps a shy person, but not at all a coward. Now, constitutionally, he may start out, the two persons may start out exactly with the same constitutional factor of timidity. Um, all this is really uh, so speculative that uh, because our studies in constitutional factors and factors of heredity and so on, our knowledge of the neurophysiological factors involved is still so much in the beginning that one can hardly make a valid scientific statement about most of these things, except as an analyst, I must say that I cannot account for the differences in the lives of people only if I consider only that they were exposed to different environmental influences. Because I have seen the same environmental influences leading to very different outcomes. And therefore, I'm forced to assume that there must be constitutional factors which enter into the picture. And that is the assumption which Freud made. In fact, Freud in this paper, which I quoted in my lecture, Analysis Terminal and Terminal, precisely thought that the reason why certain analyses never lead anywhere is to a large extent to be sought for in constitutional factor, in the strength of certain constitutional factors. Now, how far that goes is uh, a matter still of speculation. If one considers the fact that uh, our bodily build, uh, to the smallest details, uh, is constitutionally given, to a large extent hereditarily given, and if one believes that the body is a symbol of the soul, a symbolic expression of the soul, then one should assume that many, many very specific psychic traits are also given as inclinations, which are stronger in one person than in another. But as I said, uh, I can, I, uh, can uh, only cite Freud, and he also did not go further in, uh, the, in a characterization of what specifically the constitutional factor is. He applied it mainly to various forms of sexual drives and so on, to um, constitutional factors in sadism, in masochism, and so on. But really, we don't know enough, and uh, even not being specialists in this field, I know less than uh, a few specialists would know.
But I do have enough experience to say that without the assumption of the role of constitutional factors, environmental factors alone could not explain personality development. Uh, however, that does not mean that if environmental factors change personality development, the constitutional factors might not, except in extreme cases, uh, be transformed into positive rather than negative factors. But if I speak of environmental factors, then I have to say again that there, the atmosphere of a whole society and a social class is usually of greater importance than individual family factors. And that's why I believe the progress in human development depends essentially on social progress, on a, a better and more human organization of society, and that no analysis and no therapy will uh, balance whatever is made worse by failure to accomplish a more sane and a more human society. Uh, in the light of the scientific analysis of the mind, do you recognize the concept of moral sin, morality? If so, how would you define it? Well, I have written about it in a book, uh, Man for Himself, and I have written very explicitly about it in this book, The Heart of Man, where I try to say that the syndrome of evil is precisely that syndrome which I talked about today, which is also the syndrome of severe mental illness, namely symbiosis, uh, necrophilia, and narcissism. Uh, and uh, I think if you go through the moral teachings of the great religions, you will find that practically speaking, they talk about something very similar although not precise in these terms. I think there's a considerable amount of agreement in the last 5,000 years among in the human race about what's really good and what is evil, even if it's expressed sometimes uh, in a different language. Can you estimate in terms of years the amount of time necessary for an analysis involving the transformation of a personality no, I don't think one can. I think, theoretically speaking, this transformation could occur in one minute. It may take for preparation years, months. I think the transformation itself is a process of, which is not just a continuous process. Sudden things happen again and again and again. A new insight comes and something is changed then it needs set preparation for the next step. But it's not a smooth, linear uh, development of increasing insight, uh, of increasing uh, knowledge, but it is a release of energy when certain things suddenly become clear, when, certainly th when one becomes suddenly aware of things one has not been aware of. And I don't think that's a matter of time. It depends entirely on the person on his situation, on the therapeutic situation. And as I said, and for some people it happens as, it happened with this friend of mine whom I mentioned before, maybe in a, in a minute. And there is some great change. Now that may sound perhaps uh, uh, utopian to some of you. I uh, might add, it happens rarely. But it can happen that way. Therefore, you cannot say it necessarily takes this or that time. And then you might spend years and years and accomplish nothing. Um, here is the question. To what degree can men attain individuation, a sense of self and productiveness, without feeling lonely in a real sense, not loneliness in an alienated way? Well, indeed, I think that a person cannot attain individuation without feeling lonely in a real sense. I don't think a person can love without feeling separate, because love is an act of overcoming the sense of real loneliness and real separation. Uh, to look into the abyss to, of freedom one has, 
uh, makes one, as Kierkegaard said, feel dizzy. And if one feels one's existential alone loneliness, one becomes dizzy. One can overcome this dizziness by a very active and productive relatedness to the world. But if one wants to protect oneself from a real sense of loneliness, then I'm afraid one will not attain individuation. Because to fully experience oneself without anybody who is a mother or a father, or if you like to become one's own mother and one's own father, that uh, means to go through the anguish of feeling alone in a real sense. But that feeling of aloneness is at the same time the condition of all unalienated relatedness to others. When people have never left the herd, they have a nef never have felt lonely or anxious, but they also are not related to anybody except by the common smell of the herd. Um, there is one last question. If there is no eros and sex is not substituted, there, then what is there? <laughs> well, indeed, then there is nothing except business. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.